everyone and welcome to this month's masterclass. This one is going to be about opening leads, which are always important to talk about because they're a very difficult trick. They're the only time you ever have to play a card blind in Bridge. Uh, after, after you lead the first card, you get to see the dummy. So you always have a little bit more information then. But here we're, we're just playing into almost into the void. So we're going to talk about a few different techniques for how to try to pinpoint the best lead uh, before you make it. So my advice is going to fall into general advice first of all, which will for many of you be things that you've heard before um, and sort of reiterating why they're, they're good ideas or bad ideas. But obviously if you're very new to the game you might not have heard these things so it's always worth reiterating. Then I'm going to talk about passive versus versus active leads. This will dictate much of your opening leading strategy and um, it will really help you kind of visualize how the hand is going to go before you even play a card. Really useful thing to think about. And then finally I'm going to split into talking about no trumps and suit contracts separately because the strategy for those is very different. But first let's look at general advice. So this will apply to no trump or a suit contract. So first of all, we're going to talk about when you have a sequence of at least two honors, and that's anything from an ace king sequence to a 10 nine sequence. So don't worry if you've got nine eight, that no longer counts as a sequence. We're thinking about honors here. And the advice is to play top of sequence. I think everybody will be familiar with that. And here's why this is a good idea. It establishes tricks quickly. So you're in a position where you lead the king from king queen, you use your king to push out the ace, and then your queen becomes a winner. So automatically, on this first trick, you've already established a trick. Of course, the opponents might not always take their ace, so there's the possibility that they choose to let you have the trick, but then you've won your trick straight away. So either way, you, you do create a trick in the suit. An important thing that I think people often forget is that it doesn't give away cheap tricks. So if you have a jack-10 sequence and you choose, instead of leading your sequence to lead a low card, you're risking potentially losing to the nine, which is not something that you have to do because if you lead one of your jack or 10, then you can use that card to make sure that the opponents play a higher one. So you're trying to ensure that you don't give away cheap tricks and also trying to promote your tricks. And another bonus which doesn't exactly apply to establishing tricks because if you have an ace-king you already have those tricks in theory but the idea with an ace-king is that you get a chance to look at the dummy but you haven't given a trick away. So well, it can happen, but it's very, very rare. So you lead your ace, and if you decide that that wasn't the right suit to lead, you still have a chance to change your mind later, and you've still got control of that suit with the king. Other general advice, lead your partner's suit if he overcalled something. Now, I'm specifying overcalled here. doesn't necessarily have to be that they opened the bidding and then the opponents took over and they did a lot of things and then you lead your partner's suit, maybe you've got a better idea about what's going on in the hand. In that case, the partner didn't choose to open that suit. They, they opened it because that's what your system dictates they should do. But if, they, if they've chosen to overcall, one of the reasons they will do that is to direct you towards the right lead. So you've got the guaranteed suit quality. You, you know that your partner isn't going to overcall on just a bunch of low cards, because what is the point? They don't, you, know, you, you don't want to be put on the wrong path by your partner making these overcalls. And it also establishes partnership trust. So it means that you can trust your partner's overcalls and your partner knows that when they overcall, they can trust you to leave the suit. So that they sometimes they will choose to do it with a hand that maybe doesn't have the recommended point count maybe it only has seven points rather than eight or something like that whatever the situation is but the point is that they've decided that it's really really paramount to tell you what to lead 
So you want to make sure that they can trust you to make that lead. And then general advice that only applies to no trumps, leading your longest suit, probably something you've heard before. Usually the reason you're doing this is not just because you always lead your longest suit because that's not a good bridge reason to be doing something. You're doing it because you're hoping to find a partner with length or an honor there as well. So length will obviously help you get the suit going before declarer has a chance. Um, and an honor will an honor will help uh, your support your honor holdings if you have one. So Declarer might run out of cards in the suit. This is a good advantage. This is the well-known thing that people find. They lead the suit and because they started on this suit early, Declarer eventually doesn't have any cards to play in that suit and you get to cash your winners and Declarer is helpless. And that's the kind of scenario we fear most when we play in no trumps. You're also informing partner's expectations. So yes, you won't necessarily always lead your longest suit, but it's good. If partner's tossing up between two options, that card could consistently be from a short holding or a long holding. Generally, they'll expect you to have the longer holding. So again, a little bit like establishing partnership trust. It's, it's about managing your partner's expectations. And also, if partner has a really strong holding in that suit as well, you might even be able to cash the first few tricks. That's the dream. Um, you know, not letting Declara get in there. And uh, in that case, they might have to think about what to discard before they really know anything about the hand. So that's that's the dream. It does happen sometimes. And then for suit contracts, the idea is a little bit different. You're never going to be cashing length winners in a suit contract unless something's gone horribly wrong for Declarer and they've run out of trumps. So in this case, it's more important to think about leading short suits and especially singletons. Um, you know, a doubleton can work, but it's it's much much rarer that that works. Uh, normally, it's going to be a singleton that works first. The idea here is that once you've voided yourself in the suit, which you can do in one round if you have a singleton, you'll be able to rough the next round. And age-old advice uh, often gets ignored, but it really shouldn't. It's really important. If you have an unsupported ace, which is to say an ace where you don't have the king, this is a very, very dangerous lead and it's banned. Unless unless all you have is suits headed by unsupported aces. That's going to be very unusual uh, when the opponent's playing the contract. Don't do it. One of the reasons is if you lead the ace, you can be setting up declare as king. This happens all the time. And even worse, Clara might have the king and the queen somewhere, so you could be setting up two tricks for them. It just gives up so much tempo. Another reason is that if you lead low instead, it might cost a trick on quite a few layouts. Um, the easiest one to visualize is the classic singleton king, where you lead low and you no longer get a trick in the suit because they've won their king and then they ruffle the rest. Um, but you can have you know, slightly more obscure ones as well, like uh, king to three, opposite queen to three. And then they can choose to win in Declarer's hand. And then they still have that honor sitting after your ace. So they get both tricks, very annoying. Okay, let's talk about passive versus active leads now. So what does this actually mean? So. The difference between passive and active leads. Passive leads are trying to not give away tricks. They're not likely to actually create tricks, but they're, they're not really going to give anything away. And by giving, giving something away, I mean the position of honours primarily. Active leads are aiming to establish tricks very quickly. So what you're trying to do is you're trying to hit partner with a, a miracle holding, and if that comes to be, then you very quickly set up your tricks and declare is left a little bit helpless. However, the problem with active leads is that naturally, because you need partner to have this miracle holding, if they don't, 
you can give away one to quite a lot of tricks. So examples of passive leads, something like four low cards, three low cards, you know, you don't have any honours that you're uh, giving away position of. If you think about the masterclass from last month, um, I was talking about uh, being fourth position, being really advantageous because you get to play last and you get that kind of advantage over the opponents. So if you watch that video, then you'll already be thinking these kinds of things. So if you're leading away from an honor, what you're doing is you're kind of giving Declara that, that fourth position advantage when you know that you have information that he doesn't service this honor that you have. And then active leads, they, they tend to be from either unsupported honors, so it could just be like this king to four example, you only have the king, or it could be that you have a gappy honor holding, so it's not a sequence, um, you are missing cards in between. So something like king jack or queen ten, ace queen ten in this example. Um, in this very extreme example, you've got ace queen ten eight, um, which you know is is basically laying the the field open for you know nines, jacks, and kings. So you don't really want to be making this lead. Obviously, if a partner has the king, it's going to work brilliantly. Okay, sequence leads. So why do we like those so much? Well, the reason we like sequence leads is because they're both passive and active at the same time. They are highly likely to create tricks. You're just pushing out higher honours. Once they've gone, you know, the card further down in your sequence gets promoted. So that's creating tricks quite, quite easily. But because it's not giving away those cheap tricks, because you're leading one of your sequence, then it has a very low likelihood of giving trick away. So for example, you've got king, queen, jack, 10. You use the king to push out the ace, and then you have three tricks in the suit. However, when you lead this king, you're not letting the opponents have their nine, because you still have three cards that are higher than that nine. So obviously the deeper the sequence, the safer it is, and also the stronger it is, and the more tricks it's going to create. So the better the lead, basically, the, the deeper the sequence. Um, but still, even with a two card sequence, it's often a good idea. Okay, so how are we choosing between passive and active leads? So passive leads are advisable when the opponents have had an unconfident auction. So the example here, one spade, two spades, three spades, four spades. Two spades just said, you know, I've got a weak hand. I'm not expecting to make a game unless you really have a strong hand. Um, and then opener came back saying, well, I kind of have a strong hand, but I can't commit because I don't know where you are in your range. You know, are you a really terrible weak hand or are you at the upper upper end of your range? And then they say, oh, well, I, can't, I am in the upper end of my range, so I better bit a game but they've kind of wobbled their way up there. So it's not, it's not a confident auction. Another time when you might want to choose a passive lead rather than an active lead is if Declara has shown a much stronger hand than dummy. So something like two no trumps, three no trumps. No two no trumps, for the sake of argument, most people play some sort of range that is around 20 points. Three no trumps, it's only going to require you know, four or five points. So if all the points are going to be in the fourth hand position, then maybe you don't want to give away a trick um, to that fourth position. You just want to let them go off on their own or even take finesses that are going to lose, that kind of thing. Another situation when you might want to lead passively is if you know you have far more points than your partner. So if they've bid a game and you have 14 points, you know that your partner's not gonna have very much. So you can't expect your partner to have this miracle holding, and therefore you maybe don't want to give anything away. And if you're ever in doubt, so if you're thinking, oh, 
does this count as a confident or an unconfident function? Which way am I going to go with this? I'm not exactly sure what's going on. Just leave passive, passively. Um, it's it's good advice in general. A lot of people um, get a bit caught up, and we've all been guilty of it. You get caught up in this idea of, oh, but if partner has the king, everyone will praise me and I'll get written up in the newspaper. You know, you get, you get these kind of... Um, feelings like oh it would just be so amazing and it would just hurt so much if partner had this holding and i thought about the lead and then i didn't make it um but no if in doubt lead passive um and you know try not to give anything away okay active leads um these are advisable when the opponents have had a very confident auction so in this example one spade three spades invitational Four clubs. Ah, oh, I've got a cubit. Very interested in a slam here. And then uh, the invitational hand says, I don't think I'm quite suitable for slam. So they're playing in four spades. They probably have more than just the, the minimum of 25 points. Or they have some sort of nice distribution going on. They have something that made them think they might be worth a slam. But here they are two tricks lower than a slam. So... Here we're probably going to be in a situation when, where, you know, we're not expecting them to go down in this contract unless partner has this miracle holding. And then maybe, just maybe, that will be the lead to take the contract down. Another example is if the opponents have shown a source of tricks. So here they open one spade, two clubs, two spades. Three clubs, this is now shown, you know, a six card suit. And openers very confidently said, I don't I don't need support from you, I'm going to bid four spades. So you know that dummy has six clubs, and you know that they have some number of points because they bid and use it at two level. So you're not expecting them to be, you know, struggling in this contract, but you do think that maybe these clubs are going to be uh set easily set up for discards and then they're going to throw away all their losers so if you lead passively you might not get the chance to ever take your winners finally another situation where you might want to lead, make an active lead is if you know your partner has far more high card points than you do so if they've bid a game and you've got nothing then you know your partner has roughly an opening hand even if they haven't bid. Um, if they have bid, then you probably do have an indication anyway. So in these situations, you're trying to, you know, hit your partner's miracle holding. So if you've got some sort of um, on a doubleton and that's that's all in your hand, then may maybe you might make this more active lead. Okay, let's talk about strategy for leading against no trump contracts. When do you not lead from length? Because we've talked about the normal thing, leading from length. What do we, when do we not do that? So one example is when you're lacking an outside entry. So this pile of rubbish here that I've given you, um, you know, you could lead a diamond. It will work brilliantly if partner has, um, you know, king and queen and the ace gets pushed out early and, uh, you know, how is that how is that even going to happen? It's not going to happen unless your queen of hearts is a trick. It's a bit of a question mark. You know, you, you could lead your diamonds. Sure, it might work. But if it doesn't, how are you ever going to get to your hand? Um, you know, living in the world of reality, we're having to give partner quite a lot for for this diamond lead to work. You know, they're probably going to have to have the ace, the king, and the queen, and a way back to our hand. It's it's just, it's not going to happen. We can't we can't get to our winners. Um, another example is when declare has shown length in that suit. So that seems a little bit more maybe maybe more obvious. You know, if declare has got length and you've got length, then your partner's not also going to have enough length. And you might be establishing winners in, in declarer's hand anyway, so why do it? And when your partner has asked you to lead a different suit, you know, 
you, you might have your own five card suit, but if partner's overcalled, rem remember that golden rule about leading partner suit to establish partnership trust. You know, that they're, they're doing it for a reason. Um, you know, make make sure that they don't get annoyed. It's it's really worth keeping the harmony in the partnership. This is an auction that's worth mentioning all on its own because you have so much information that I think that a lot of people don't realize that they have because it's all negative inferences. By negative inferences, I just mean information that you have by things that the opponents have not said. So one no trump, three no trumps. What do we know? We know that responder hasn't bid stame nor transferred. So at most, you're going to be three three in the majors. So in this case, you want to be really angling towards leading the major most of the time against this auction. Still thinking about, you know, who has the points, you know, is it you or is it your partner or do you have kind of roughly an equal number? But, you know, think think about what's going on on this hand. Probably the opponents are going to have the minors all sewn up. So you want to attack the majors um, as soon as you can. Finally, leading against suits. Any more advice other than leading shortage? Well, when do you not lead shortage? When you are also short in trumps, um, sometimes it's kind of instinctive to lead uh, your singleton, but then you suddenly realise that you've also got a singleton trump. I mean, this is rare, but it happens. The doubleton is extra optimistic. You know, you're really unlikely to get your rough. Your partner might have the ace but normally they don't, um, and, you know, if they don't, you're never going to be able to, you know, in enjoy your rough anyway, so why do it? And another thing to think about is that when you lead a singleton normally, often you're doing it because not only do you have the, the chance that partner has the ace in that suit, but they might also have the ace of trumps. And if they can win that, they might give you your rough before um, declarer gets to draw trumps. But in this situation, you know, if you only have one trump, it doesn't even help if partner has the ace. So you know, it takes away some of your um, roughing likelihood. Another thing to think about, when you would be roughing with a trump trick, um, so if you have a strong trump holding, that causes declarer quite a lot of headache. Um, <laughs> how am I supposed to... Sometimes they've already played the suit incorrectly by the time they realise you, you have a trump trick, and sometimes they spend the whole hand trying to work out how to manoeuvre around your, your four card or five card trump holding. Um, and, you know, they, they kind of lose control of the other suits. So, you know, what you don't want is to give Declare an easy way of forcing you to use your trumps without threatening their trump holding. Because remember, you really want them to be using up two trumps for, for every trump that you have. What about... What about in uh, situations where it's a singleton specifically? So the previous slide could have applied to uh, doubletons or singletons, but this is just for singletons. So. Think about it, against a slam when you hold an ace. We talked about a situation earlier where we led a singleton and we were hoping for partner to have the ace in that suit, or the alternative was that maybe the partner would have the ace of trumps. But if you have an ace and you're playing against a slam, chances are partner doesn't have an ace unless they've botched up Blackwood um, or they skip backward entirely and, and it was the wrong thing to do. Um, in which case, they're going down anyway, so you don't really need to worry about it. When dummy has shown length and strength there. So we're thinking about hands a little bit like um, where we saw the auction earlier where dummy had six clubs. Um, Maybe we don't want to be leading a singleton club because we know we're just setting up their suit. 
when you hold an ace king elsewhere, um, you know, singletons are really good leads and an ace king sequence is a really good lead. So which really good lead do you choose? And the answer is generally better to lead the ace from ace king. There obviously are exceptions where it's necessary to lead the singleton first. Um, but generally, the good thing about leading the ace from ace king is that you get to lead your ace look at the dummy and then decide whether your singleton is going to work. So you get that extra chance. Maybe your partner gets to give you a signal. Maybe you see something in the dummy that puts you off. You know, you, you have a bit more information by the time you make that crucial decision. And finally, another time would be if this singleton is an honor. You know, of course it could work. It could definitely work. I mean, you could lead your singleton king. Um, and partner might work out that they're supposed to be overtaking with the ace or something and cashing the queen and then it, it, they, they might they might um but it, it, partner will often find it difficult to read they might just think you're playing top of sequence they might think you're playing top of a doubleton they might not know what to do um so it does put the pressure on a little bit plus if it's something like a queen it can easily give away a guess with De Clara, you know, they might have been a little bit stuck, not knowing which way to finesse, and now you've just told them where the queen is and the whole hand is solved. Thinking about um, when to lead trumps is always a tricky one. Um, some people are shocked by the idea that they can even lead trumps, and some people um, will do it on an occasion when it really works and then get really wedded to the idea of leading trumps and do it too often. So this is just guidelines for when, when you should be thinking about leading trumps. So here, first situation is when you have a strong hand that has unattractive side suit leads. This is the one that people classically lead a trump with. Um, you know, you want to be passive, so you don't want to give anything away in one of the other suits. Maybe they're each headed by an unsupported ace or a king or something like that. You, know, you don't want to give away where the honours are, so you lead a trump and you let Declara work it out by themselves. Another situation would be when the opponent stop in open his second suit in a preference auction. So there's quite a lot of jargon to unpack in this one. So we're thinking about situations where the where opener has maybe opened a spade and their partner has bid a no trump and then they've bid two clubs and then they are playing in two clubs. What does that actually tell you about the hand? Well, you can think about it this way. If Responder had any interest in playing in spades at all, they'd have expressed it over two clubs. You know, they can easily go to two spades. They're not showing extra points. They're not even showing three spades. Um, they're only promising two. So if they have equal length in both suits, then they'll pick spades because their pawns promise more of them. Um, even if they have unequal length and the spades are slightly shorter, they're supposed to give false preference, right? They're supposed to, with two spades and three clubs, they're supposed to give their partner that extra bid because they're not promising more than two anyway. They can afford to do that, but if partner has a strong hand, they can then bid on later. So in that case, what do we know? We know that if they've stopped in the second suit, they are short in the first suit. And we know the opener has length there, so we're expecting a lot of roughing to be happening. So by leading the trump, what we're doing is we're trying to cut down on those roughs. There's a similar idea um, in the next point with the strong holding into Clara's second suit. So if you have, um, if this is a suit that they're not using as trumps, so Clara at some point has mentioned length in this, you know that because you have a good holding and Declara has length, that they're not going to be, you know, winning tricks by force because they're not going to be able to. You've got too many, many honours in the suit. So the way they're going to get rid of these losers is by roughing them. So what you're trying to do is you're cutting down the shorthand roughs. Other situations are where 
the opponents are playing in a double part score and they have the balance of power. So we're expecting them to be, sorry, you have the balance of power. So you're expecting them to be, you know, struggling for tricks a little bit. You know, they're in a, a dodgy contract that you, you thought during the auction wouldn't make, um, either you or your partner, and you have more points than they do. So how are they going to take tricks? They're going to rough things. That's, that's the only way they can do it, really. And in a similar idea, when they sacrifice, um, they're, they're not doing it because they, they think they've got the power to make the contract. They're doing it because they think that you might be making your contract. So in these situations where you know that you and your partner are defending with more points than them, that might be a situation where you think, oh, okay, they're going to make their tricks by roughing, so I should need a trump to cut down the roughs. And what about when not to lead trumps? Don't get too trump happy. Against Islam, just generally. If, if they're playing in Islam, they're very likely even if they've the black wood, to be playing in a slam where they have to guess where the queen of trumps is, um, sometimes the jack, they, they have to try to figure out what to do in the trump suit. And if they manage to do that, they make the slam, um, and if they don't, then they don't. So that's really common. So if you lead a trump, what you're doing is you're saying, huh, this is where the trumps are, and then Clara's problem is solved. So let them, let them keep their problem. Another situation when you shouldn't be leading trumps is when Declara or Dummy has shown a source of tricks or when you have a very weak hand. And this is all related to trying not to be too passive. And so these are situations where we know we're supposed to be making an active lead. A trump is a very passive lead. You're generally not expecting to give away a trick or create a trick. You know, you're not leading a trump because you think your partner might have a good trump holding and, and you might established tricks there, you're doing it because you don't want to give something away in a different suit. And finally, another situation when you are long or short in trumps. So if you are long, then it could be that you're giving away your own trump trick. If you have something like um, uh, Jack 10 to 4, you might just be giving away a trick that you have. So you don't want to <laughs> lead that suit and say, here you go, Clara, win your cheap trick with your nine. You don't want that. Similarly, if you only have one trump and they're in an eight card fit, you know that your partner has four. So you don't want to give away your partner's trump holding. And another reason why not to do it is because there's a missed opportunity for either roughing or forcing defense. So if one of you has um, four trumps, then if they're not very good ones, you want that person to be able to take lots of roughs. You know, then the, the trumps themselves are not going to cause a problem, but the number of roughs they can take might. And similarly, with, with these holdings, if you have lots of honours in the suit, what you don't want to do is kind of is, is let Declara take control of the hand by drawing trumps and then taking their winners. You want to keep forcing Declara to rough with their trumps until the four card trump holding on your side is stronger than Declara's trump holding. And then you start to gain control of the hand. Okay, so uh, there's a lot to absorb in this one, but you know, go ahead, check whether you, you have absorbed it Give the practice hands a go and see how you get on. And I look forward to seeing you there.